Welcome to Smith Rubric, Educators Without Borders. I'm your host, Sarah Springer. I'm part of the School Rubric team and the Director of Professional Learning. But I've also served as an instructional support for teachers, a curriculum writer, and currently a school administrator. On today's topic, we're discussing improving student outcomes through instructional coaching and integration. And I'm pleased to welcome three colleagues of mine from schools and districts around the world. Heidi McGregor, a K-5 STEM integration specialist from Littleton, Massachusetts. Marcy Curley, the elementary math coordinator in Frisco, Texas. Sarah Donaldson, a K-8 literacy coach and soon to be elementary school assistant principal at an international school in Brazil. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Before we jump into today's topic and take a look at the questions we've received, I'd love to pass the baton around the group and have each of you share a little bit more about yourselves and your role in education. Heidi, let's start with you. Hi. Um, thanks, Claire. It's great to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Heidi McGregor, formerly a fourth grade teacher. Um, but now I am the K-5 STEM Integration Specialist for Littleton Public Schools in Massachusetts. And I also serve on the board of the Massachusetts ISTE affiliate called MassQ. Thank you, Heidi. Marcy. Hi, my name is Marcy Corley and I serve as an elementary math coordinator in Frisco ISD, that's in Frisco, Texas, outside of Dallas you're familiar with that. Um, and I'm happy to be here and share any experiences that um, I've had with instructional coaching. Thanks, Marcy. Sarah, take it away. Hi, I'm Sarah Donaldson. I um, actually started my career in Ontario in public education for 10 years and then moved abroad with my family and was a classroom teacher and a lead teacher in South Korea at a wonderful international school called KIS. Uh, just outside of Seoul, and now I am in my third year of literacy coaching. I'm a student-centered coach, and this year I took on an additional role. I'm also the elementary school associate principal, so I'm really excited to listen and talk. Thank you, Sarah. Well, without further ado, let's head right into our discussion and questions. We've received four questions from educators around the world. And if you're watching, feel free to leave a comment or question in the chat and we'll try our best to answer those along the way. Our first question comes from Paola San Martini, a secondary NYP and DP mathematics teacher at an international school in Malawi. Hi, I'm Paola San Martini. I'm an American Italian uh, teaching in Malawi. And I'm wondering what made you leave the classroom? What made you decide to leave the classroom and, and pursue a role in integration and coaching as opposed to administration or even staying in the classroom? And what have been some of the challenges, biggest challenges and surprises in that move? All right. Heidi, what are your thoughts on that question? Um, she brought up a great question there. Um, first of all, I really haven't ruled out maybe going into administration someday. Um, I'm drawn to the role and impact that something like a director of innovation um, could play um, in, in a larger scale. Um, but as for trans transitioning out of the classroom and into the role of STEM integration, um, I saw firsthand with my fourth graders the impact that integrating projects with tools like green screens, Makey Makeys, 3D printing, YouTube channels, all of those great things um, I could see were, were just great for student engagement and achievement. Um, so when my district announced that they were creating a new position for K-5 STEM integration, um, in my mind, I was like, oh, I still love being a fourth grade teacher and I love that experience, but I just could not resist <laughs> the opportunity to partner with teachers, to help them integrate STEM into the curriculum and to sort of like scale up that impact, you know, going from a 24 students in a one year uh, window to scaling up to 750 students over a course of six years together. 
um, you know, so for example, like if instead of doing a, like a one and done 3D printing integration project with one group of students, now I have the opportunity to create a broader, richer experience rooted in, you know, digital fabrication that we can start in kindergarten and build on um, throughout the, um, until they leave our elementary schools in fifth grade. Um, at one point, you had asked about um, surprises and challenges, you know, so at first I was a little worried about um, giving up those close relationships um, that you cultivate in an elementary classroom. That's like the best part of being an elementary school teacher. Um, worried about losing that, um, I'm not gonna lie. Um, it's different as an integrationist, but I have been so pleasantly surprised um, that I can still build those connections and relationships um, with students as well as my colleagues. You know, I'm able to connect with colleagues um, in ways that you can't when you're when you're in a classroom all day long. You know, I can move around and, and work with a lot of people. So there's been some real um, pleasant surprises. <laughs> you know, you, you spoke the word impact several times. And I remember interviewing for my first job outside of the classroom and how it was down to the one-on-one -on -one interview. And for quite a while, that's the one thing we talked about is, you know, wanting to have an impact on a larger scale and how, you know, you do, you do create such close bonds with your class and with your teammates, but you can do the same thing outside of the classroom. It's just um, taking the time to build those relationships because you certainly have, you know, an extended amount of people to um, get to know, but you definitely can find that same community feel um, and you get to you get to play out a calling that's far greater and larger than what you did just in your own classroom so exactly. thank you for sharing and that was a great question by paola for us to start digging deeper into the world of coaching and integration let's take a look at our next question which comes to us from christian a teaching and learning coordinator at an international school in brazil Hi, my name's Christian, and I'm teaching and learning coordinator at Escola Aleva Brasilia. Here's my question. I see a lot of school districts use different categories of roles, ranging from specialist to coach to integrationist. And these roles are sometimes subject and grade specific or quite general. There are also roles I've seen which are site-based versus district-based. Can you share your knowledge of the similarities and differences among all these different roles? A great question by Christian. Sarah, I know that you can talk site-based versus district-based um, when it comes to a specialist and coach role. So talk to us about your experience in that area. Yeah, um, I can first talk to the idea of a specialist in regard to coaching um, because that's my, my role. Um, many coaches though are general instructional coaches and they might not really specialize in one or more specific subject areas or grades and they could work at one school or, or site or they may work across a certain number of schools. So I think it really depends on if the coach works for a public school district like you might see in Canada or in America. And it might be based on that coach's, um, the, the program structure that that coach is working within that district. Mm -hmm. um, they might work uh, across a number of schools and they might work also in, in one school. So in my experience, when I worked in Ontario, I was a coach and I had an option to either be district-wide and go from school to school and I had the ch other choice was to be site-based in one school. And so my PD um, happened district-wide, but I serviced a school just in a site-based school. And I was a specific uh, subject area. I was English language learner, uh, coach for teachers. Personally, right now, I work for a private international school in Brazil and I am a literacy specialist. And so that makes me um, qualified to be the literacy coach and my specialist qualifications, my experience teaching literacy and EAL, and my master's all add to that qualification. So that's my specialization area. Mm -hmm. I do work across grade levels. I work from kindergarten all the way up to grade eight. So I don't specialize in a grade level, but I do specialize in a subject. Um, I would say overall, um, regardless of specialization or coaching model even, um, it's the goal really 
is is common across uh, differently these different roles. I think the goal really is to move teaching and learning forward for the benefit of all the learners, whether those learners are big or whether those learners are small. So there might be different roles, but the similarity is always the same. The goal is to move teaching and learning forward. Thank you, Sarah. Marcy, what is your experience in the similarities and differences? So I completely agree with um, what Sarah said, and I'm fortunate to um, have been in a district where we've seen um, coaching evolve over um, a good eight to nine uh, years, and we've got coaching and technology, and we have coaches that serve in language roles, um, helping kids with linguistic accommodations. And so I think you really have to hone in on just the definition of coach. And, you know, often when I think about supporting teachers in the role of a PR coach or a specialist or an integrationist, um, I kind of make a connection to sports in relation to that. And a coach, when you think of sports, is often standing in the sidelines um, watching their players. They might also be looking at a playbook to help give some recommendations of next things to do. Um, they're offering words of encouragement and motivating players to continue to um, keep it all on the field. Sometimes they're conferring with the other coaches on the sidelines. They're talking in their headsets to the coaches upstairs. Sometimes you see some frustration and some screaming for <laughs> coaches on the sidelines. But um, I kind of take a step back and think about all of those different things you see those coaches doing. What impact is that having on those players? And how does that role influence the way they operate on a day-to-day -day basis? And, you know, several years ago, I had an um, instructional coach share a quote from Nick Saban, who it's perfect timing because, you know, he's University of Alabama's head football coach, and they just uh, won the national championship. Um, and he has a statement where he says, success doesn't come from pie in the sky. Um, thinking that it's the result, thinking as a result of consciously doing something each day that will add to your overall excellence, whether it's on the field or off the field. And so I think the coach of the role of a coach or a specialist or facilitator is the same. It's someone whose purpose is to guide and support another person towards reaching the level of personal and professional excellence. And who doesn't want that, right? I mean, so coaching truly is centered on the belief that not like if you think about the PLC for our students, everybody has the ability to learn and be successful at high levels. And that coach, the specialist, the facilitator, when partnering with teachers, can truly transform a person's journey towards reaching the goals. So like Sarah said, I think you have to think about there's a lot of similarities, even though you might be addressing the instructional piece of it or the content piece of it. You know, our secondary coaches, they, they still are in the classroom as well part time. So they're working directly with students. Um, then we have our technology facilitators, but they still have that same ultimate goal of, you know, impacting students in any way that they can. I mean, we all need a coach to kind of help balance and continue working to where goals are set. Thank you, Marcy, for sharing that. I'm wondering, you spoke of all the different types of coaches you have in your district, and you're so lucky to, your campuses are so, so lucky to have that um, high level of support in the role of a coach. What creative ways have any of you seen your district respond to when maybe the um, the depth of the coaching pool, for let's just say, isn't there. What resources can districts tap into to help teachers along the way if there isn't necessarily um, an instructional coach program? Like, are you speaking like if districts do not have the capability to have coaches no, on or campus? The funding or um, the programming for it? I, mean, I think if you look for the teachers that you can build their capacity in serving as that role um, as teacher leaders, mm -hmm. or even, you know, like some, most campuses have maybe like head teachers or um, team leaders, and so looking at their role a little bit strategically is not making it more managerial, um, but truly more of an instructional leader on their campus, and really starting to start some peer coaching between not only the teachers on their team, but maybe cross, um, cross the campus might be a creative way to kind of look at that. I love that. 
and those learning walk opportunities that you can do classroom to classroom. Heidi, in your experience, what have you seen your district do or other districts around you be creative in this? Um, yeah, I think um, I definitely Littleton, Massachusetts is a much smaller district yes. than where, where Marcy is from. Uh, we have um, you know, four, a total of four schools, the two elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. So we're a very small mm -hmm. um, group. Um, so um, you know, the, 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 the people that, you know, the educators in our, in our um, organization are kind of used to doing multiple things, right? Pitching in when things are needed. Like we have two tech coordinators um, who, you know, their job is to keep our network running. And, um, but they, they do a lot of professional development around educational technology. Um, you know, we have teacher leaders, like you're explaining. So like each grade level, we'll have a teacher leader at our um, secondary school. You know, that there's um, teacher leaders for the different content areas who pitch in and, and try to, to, they help each other. Um, but definitely it's it's at any point, someone, any educator in our district can take a leadership role um, in, in doing um, uh, this work. Um, so um, for example, we do um, um, faculty led professional development modules um, at our school. So our director of curriculum organizes this each year um, and any faculty member can offer a um, professional development opportunity. Um, and then anyone from any of the four schools can sign up and attend um, and work with, with any educator. So um, it's a very collegial, you know, very cooperative. We, we're, we're definitely in it together. <laughs> Thank you. Our third question of the evening comes to us from Ryan Sagar, my colleague, friend, and co-founder of School Rubric in Austin, Texas. Let's take a listen and discuss on the other side. What's going on, everybody? Excited for the panel. Can you share any insights you have into what your day-to-day -day looks like as an instructional coach or integrationist? How do you juggle and manage all the day-to-day -day responsibilities while keeping track of your progress and alignment with your logic strategic goals? Thank you. Now, Sarah, I know that you are a practitioner of juggling responsibilities. Talk to us about what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis with you. Yeah, I have a pretty set schedule. Um, I think I have to have a set schedule or I would definitely lose track and everything goes in my Google calendar. Um, but I'll, I'll speak really just to the, to the coaching part of my job. So um, as a student-centered coach, I co-plan with teachers uh, a couple times a week and then we also do a lot of co-teaching. So how do I juggle and manage it all? It's just a really tight schedule. So I would send out an invitation to teachers to see who would like to work with uh, me as their literacy coach. And then I usually only take about four. Um, sometimes I can squeeze in five if I'm really careful, if I'm really tight with my schedule. And so I only take on four to five people in, in a cycle. And so a given cycle is about six weeks. And that I have very, very clear set times when I go in and co-teach with a teacher. And that's during their literacy block. And the teacher chooses if it's reading or writing. And we have set predetermined co-plan times in the week as well. And so before a coaching cycle even starts though, because obviously we need to keep track of our progress together as coach and coachee and student growth. And so what we do is we first collect just baseline data and the teacher always chooses if he or she would like to focus on reading or on writing. So reading as our example, we might collect data on the number of students reading above, at and below grade level. And we then use this during a co-planning time. The teacher really leads this. Um, because I'm a student-centered coach and so the teacher and I look at the student data and the teacher chooses uh, a goal. Um, we record the goals in the language of our uh, standards that we use. We use the Common Core State Standards for Literacy and so we record goals in the language of the standards in the form of learning targets. Then we co-plan and co-teach and co-assess uh, student work in relationship to those goals 
And there's a lot of differentiated instruction that happens. So a lot of recording of what are the lesson plans looking like? What did the students do during the lesson? Why do we think they might have done that? We reflect on that during our co-plan times. And then we think, okay, what are our next steps? So everything is recorded in a document that I share with the teachers. And it's based on the work of Diane Sweeney, who is like the student-centered coaching guru. So all of this data and all of this teaching is constantly recorded and collected. And then at the end of a cycle, about six weeks later, we do another similar, more formal assessment. So let's use reading as our example. So we've been we've been tracking their reading progress as we go every time we teach a lesson or have a small group or work one one on one with a student. But formally, we reassess them at the end of the six weeks because we're accountable um, to see did the students move? Was there growth? And it, that is then attached to our larger strategic goals that are set out in the strategic plan. So we collect data again at the end of the cycle and to see was there a change based on what the teacher and I did together. And then we reflect on what are our growth needs as coach and coachee and what are the students needs moving forward. So even though the coaching cycle ends, the measurement of student growth doesn't end. And so we make a plan for next steps. So that's when I coach one teacher. I also coach teams in uh, professional learning communities and PLCs. And we're constantly communicating through email, through Google Calendar. There's an elementary student, elementary school website with a section on literacy where common assessments are stored, where celebrations are shared about student growth. And we do a lot of data tracking. Uh, we use Google Sheets to create a huge reading data wall. So student data is collected over over years and years and years, and it can always be accessed. And that's basically how I track progress and stay in alignment with uh, larger goals and teacher goals that they have for their students. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing. Heidi, talk to us about what your day-to-day -day looks like as an integrationist specialist. Yeah, it was it was really great to listen to um, Sarah's model, um, which sounds like a really like a structured, like really um, data driven coaching model. Um, whereas in Littleton, um, we're doing more of um, it feels a little more holistic than that in some ways, because um, it's truly just integrating STEM into into what's happening in the school day. So it's just another approach. Um, and I totally agree with Sarah that Google Calendar <laughs> It's the way to go. It is my lifeline. It, I just have to like everything is in there. You know, even um, even opportunities to think about a new project. I, I'll I'll put twenty minutes in there to make sure that I don't forget to do that. Um, but the day to day as an integrationist is so different um, than when I was a classroom teacher. Um, I no longer have those direct responsibilities with students. So my daily schedule is no longer driven by things like lunch and recess and making sure we get to art on time and those kinds of things. Um, so I have much more control over my day, um, but I also, it's just jam packed from start to finish. And I just have to remember to um, take, take some breaths. <laughs> um, but as I build my schedule week by week, um, I am always checking in with the administrators um, in our two buildings um, that I work with. I, um, I check in with the teachers. I actually check in with the students quite a bit too, um, just to keep an idea on what's happening in the classrooms. What, what are they learning about? What are they reading? What's going on in science? What like things that are happening outside of our um, classrooms as well, like what's going on. Um, and I really try to tailor um, what's, what I'm um, able to bring to um, them in the form of STEM um, so that it um, matches up with what their reality is, right? Like I'm trying to be responsive to, to our, my community. Um, so like, for example, um, the third and fourth graders are going to be learning about poetry soon. Um, so I'm developing a coding unit with scratch coding um, so that they can animate and code poetry um, as part of one of their, one of their um, assignments. Um, but what I'm really trying to do all the time, like when you when you talk about how do you keep sight of what your goals are and everything. So everything that I'm planning and everything that I'm doing, I run it through my filter of those overarching um, missions that I have as a STEM um, integrationist. So I want to make sure that the things that I'm doing are actually empowering students to drive their own learning. I want them to see themselves as problem solvers. Um, I want my students 
in, in my two elementary schools to create more than they consume, mm -hmm. especially with technology. Um, I want to make these learning experiences so enticing um, that they just get hooked in and they want to keep going and they want to keep working on it. Um, I also have a mission to invite families and the broader community into what we're doing with STEM. I think that gives a lot of power um, to what kids are learning. Um, and I really want to make sure that, that what I'm doing makes it easier on the classroom um, teachers uh, I don't want it to be feel like a burden to work this stuff in. I want it to be like seamless to be able to integrate STEM um, into their into their curriculum. Um, so I try really hard to be even handed because um, I'm working with um, teachers from kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, so I make sure that you know once we once we do a STEM integration project together that you know I circle back, I check in, I get some feedback, um, I make sure that. Um, um, each grade is getting what they need from me, but but not too much, you know. Um, <laughs> like for example, um, hour of code normally. Um, I don't know if you do that in your schools, but the hour of code is a pretty big deal for us, and it's officially in December. But um, at one of the schools that I that I work with, we decided to postpone it until um, actually this week. It's happening in January um, because um, in December during that hour of code time, we had an all school engineering challenge going on. We had a virtual makerspace passion project going on and it was just too much. So we just made the decision to just push it off until January and and it's it's going really well. Um, but then like another example, um, a couple of months, months ago, I worked with kindergarten to put together these steam bags for students to take home and do novel engineering projects with them. Um, but it's been a couple of months since I've checked in with kindergarten to um, see what's going on. So I just met with the kindergarten teachers last week um, and we're working on an introduction to laser cutting um, to do some um, digital fabrication together. So it's just, it's a constant, um, I think Ryan used the word juggling. It's a constant juggling act. Um, and that's really a, an accurate way to describe it. <laughs> you know, I, what resonated though with me, Heidi, and it's something that I personally have to stay focused on on the day to day because you can get lost in your to do list and then your to do list becomes other people's to do lists. And but it's staying focused on that mission and ensuring that everything on your list is in alignment with the mission of your school and that the community that you work with, all the stakeholders, parents, um, community members, teachers, students, know what that mission is and know that every day when we come into this building, we're doing things to reach our mission and our vision. And then ensuring that those collective commitments um, are followed through with on the day-to-day -day basis. And Sarah mentioned, you know, with student outcomes, you're focused on those goals and you're focused on the student results and the student outcomes. And, uh, you know, just being very crystal clear on what is it that we want to accomplish, whether it's today or this week or the six weeks in this cycle. And, you know, it goes back to building those relationships. And um, I think ultimately, though, it's focusing on that mission of your school or your institute. So... Thank you guys. Thank you both for sharing. Um, it's very insightful just to hear two very different day-to-days, but both very similar in a lot of ways. Let's take it to our last question this evening, which comes from another podcast host, Charles Williams. He's the host of Counter Narrative Podcast and a K-8 principal from Chicago, Illinois. Let's listen in. Hey guys, Charles Williams here from CW Consulting. And listen, I have a question for you. I know that the work that we do is super important, but sometimes it is difficult to communicate that to stakeholders in a relatable and transparent way. So if I ask you, what are some tools that you have found to be effective in measuring or assessing the important work that you do with staff, students, and parents? Marcy, I know you spent a lot of time with the group of teachers and leaders that you work with. Talk to us about this process that you guys have used to effectively measure the progress of coaching and integrationists on your campuses. You know, that's something we have spent a lot over the last um, probably year and a half really talking um, with our coaches and our administrators on the campus. Um, our coaches or um, instructional coaches were 
evaluated using the teacher tool. And so we were finding that, was that truly measuring our instructional coach program? Um, if people were to come to us and say, you know, how do you know that your coaching program is effective for your campuses or making an impact? How do you know they're effective? Um, and so, you know, over our work, we, we tried to do some research of, you know, how do you measure coaching? Um, is there a tool out there? You know, I'm always kind of, um, our coaches do a lot of work through Jim Knight and the instructional coaching group. And so he has, him and his consultants have been very vital um, in helping us really see how do you measure impact of the coaching um, role. And so what we've done over the past year and a half is really created more of a rubric to honor the work that our coaches do. Um, coaches are constantly helping teachers see the power behind balancing reflection and action. And there has to be a balance that occurs in order for students um, and their outcomes to be different. And so when coaches are providing a space for teachers to notice and reflect, we have to have the tool to kind of help coaches see that they are being effective. Um, in my in a role, I served as an instructional coach role, and you don't get that instant gratification as when you were a teacher in the classroom. Um, when you're in the classroom, you can see your kids getting it, you can see those light bulbs going off, you've got so much data coming out of every single thing that you do with students. But then you shift into a, a coach role or a facilitator role or a specialist, and you don't always have that right there for you. Um, and so looking at surveys that can be done, looking at setting goals, like Sarah was speaking, um, Diane Sweeney from the Student Centered Coaching is huge. Uh, we looked at her work too, of really just seeing are there those, um, I think she calls it a results-based coaching tool that basically shows that coaching cycle and what it looks like at the beginning and what it looks like at the end. We have some pre and post assessments that are identifying the growth that's happened with our teachers that we've truly done um, some amazing things. Um, exit interview questions. I know we're, we work with Jim Knight in the impact cycle and there's reflection questions and he has a ton of tools that our teachers um, utilize when they're collecting current reality of the teacher to really help, help them make a student focus goal, whether it's teacher questions versus student questions, negative interactions versus positive ones. So I think it's really finding those hard data points for our coaches to help see that they are truly impacting the work that they do. I know the work as a district administrator in the central office, we are trying to always have our coaches reflect um, on their progress because, you know, we support them as well. So it's like we're the coach to the coaches and we've I've had people in the past go, I just don't know if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because you don't see it right then and there. But as long as it's aligned to what the vision of the campus is, and I heard that already stated, um, their campus action plans, you know, have they set personal SMART goals for themselves and are they checking in? Because I think all too often when you get into a coach or a specialist, you, you're worried about helping grow the teachers and their goal instead of like, what are your goals? Are there coaching skills that you are working on and can I help support you? So it kind of can be a little ambiguous for them because you know they're supporting the teachers so much, but who is supporting them? So I think finding a system, if you're not fortunate to have the structures that a larger district that I serve have, you have to find those ways to tap in and reflect. Is it a coaching guide? Um, I've had coaches in the past have created more Google forms where they have a QR code. So every time that they're working with teachers, they'll scan in their work. So at the end of the week, they can look on paper that these are the things that you did throughout the week. And these are how many students you impacted based on this one teacher goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is slow and steady. We don't try to like have this big, large picture but they do need to celebrate all of the work that they're doing because it's some pretty amazing things that coaches do on campus. And so as a district admin, we really want to honor that and we've created a rubric for them um, to really show that not based on like a teacher rubric, but based on an instructional coach rubric that can really um, help monitor that and show their administrators too that you know if they ever were to question, what do you do on a daily basis? that you know, they have impact on your campus because these are all the things that they are doing with these teachers and this is the amount of kids 
that are being impacted by the work that they are doing. So it kind of takes that, not look at standardized testing, but let's look to see how many kids are being impacted by the teacher's goals that the coach is helping them with. Marcy, you brought up so many great points. One thing that made me think of was in Diane Sweeney's book, uh, Student-Centered Coaching, she talks about coaching labs and you know, letting coaches have the opportunity to learn from one another. And, you know, I think that is a powerful time because we expect them to go and do every each and every day with teachers and they do make such an impact no matter what kind of uh, model you're using. But remembering as campus leaders to provide time for those coaches to learn with either coaches on their campus or other coaches within the district because it can be lonely and it can feel isolating at times. And so making sure that we're um, building them up and acknowledging the goals that they set and celebrating the success along the way. I love the idea of the QR code because you're right. There's so many kids that they impact on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis that it's, it's mind blowing really when you put it down on paper um, that you maybe don't necessarily see the immediate wins like we do with our own students in our classroom. Sarah, do you have anything to add on this question from Charles? Yeah, sure. I can kind of, first of all, I just wanted to say, uh, Marcy, I wish I had a coach for a coach. Um, what I what I ended up doing, because I felt so alone, right? Um, so there's actually a digital coaching PLC where coaches all around South America uh, we all set coaching goals, depending on the model of coaching that we wanted. And then we recorded video footage or audio footage, depending on what the comfort level of the teacher was. And we said, okay, this is the goal. Here's the video. Can you please give me uh, feedback on, on that goal? Like, what? how did I do? What evidence did you see in the video? What are my next steps? So that helped. But to have someone like live and direct with me would be wonderful. Those coaching labs, I've never... I've experienced it, but not frequently enough, I feel, for it to really service me. So I'm listening to you, Marcy, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I really have to rely, the digital coaching PLC is we meet very infrequently. It's just a few times a year because we're so, we're so busy. Um, but I really do rely on the teachers. And I worked really hard to build great relationships with them. And so we're super honest with one another. And so at the end of a coaching cycle, I will sit down. And I think, Marcy, you kind of mentioned the importance of the space to notice and reflect. Um, I think it's just as important for teachers as it is for coaches. So I'll sit with the teachers and I'll say, tell me, how, how was this coaching cycle for you? How was I as your coach? Like, what do you, what were some missed opportunities, I say? And what are some things that you would love to do if we were to coach together next time? Um, because I don't want to put them in the position of saying, oh, Sarah, this stunk and I didn't like this. So I always word it in um, the phrase of what are some wonderings or what were some missed opportunities so that they feel comfortable giving me um, some constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. So I really rely on the teachers and I think that they're honest with me because I worked very long and hard and I continue to uh, work long and hard to maintain trust-based relationships with them and to know them on a personal level. And I adore all the teachers that I work with. Um, and then another way is we measure the success of the coaching. As I said before, just measuring using student data, uh, using the student-centered coaching protocols. And you've already touched on that a little bit, Marcy. And we just basically are asking ourselves, did we reach our goals? What percentage of students moved forward towards that goal? Another thing that I do is I, instead of doing only two co-teaches in um, a week or in a six day rotation, I try to do three or four. So yes, it makes me busier. And yes, I'm totally addicted to Google Calendar, but it helps me to ensure that I'm always in the classroom. It helps me to kind of be in the muck with the teachers. So I'm right there, I'm steeped in what the kids are doing. I'm steeped in, in the data. Students can give you feedback too. Um, if I do something wrong, if I miss, if I miss something, they'll say, uh, no, that's actually not the right feedback. You probably should have told me this. And it's great because then the teachers can see that like I mess up too, even though I, I'm a literacy specialist, right? A kid will say to me, yeah, you got the compliment right, but the teaching point, I think you really need to pay attention to this instead. Can you show me that instead? And I'll be like, yep, 
this is definitely student empowered, right? They, they know what they need and they'll tell you if, you if you're off. So I rely on the teachers and the students. Um, and I think the other question was also about communicating with transparency. That was the other part of the question. And I think, I think communication, it's a dialogue, right? So sometimes traditional PD comes from the expert to the teachers, but the teachers are the experts in what they want to know. So I always send out like a Google form for like a needs and wants assessment to see what do you want PD designed for? What do you want it to look like? Oftentimes teachers really appreciate me communicating something to them, like teaching them something, and then having them have like an opportunity to do job embedded learning. So they'll go and they'll apply it in their classrooms or watch one another apply it in their classrooms, kind of in like a lab site. And so communicating with teachers by getting information from them, like what do you want to learn? What do you want to learn? Um, I think that's really important. And I do the same thing with parents prior to COVID. Uh, Brazilian parents stereotypically and thankfully are super communicative. So they will come right up to me and say, all right, Miss Literacy Coach. So we're all talking and we're at each other's house and we want you to do some sort of a session on this for us. And then I'll say, okay, great. I'm going to design it. Like you find out from what all the parents want, send me an email and I'll design something for you. And so I've got to really lead some great parent sessions. And I think the key is that the communication has to go both ways. And so hearing from teachers, hearing truly from parents, what do they want? Um, and that's the, I think the key to communication, that it's a dialogue, it's two ways. And also just finding out if it's effective. Uh, the parents are really, really vocal and they'll just tell me like, that was wonderful. I have no idea why you just said this, but the rest of it was great. And so I always take note of what they said, or I'll have like a parking lot, which is just like a piece of anchor chart paper and they can use sticky notes and then they just leave feedback anonymously um, to tell me what did they think of the session? What did they learn? What did they wish I had included? What didn't they like? Um, and I think that's really important to give people a voice either face to face and a lot of people might be comfortable with that, but also through an anonymous Google form or like a sticky note parking lot, low tech, right? And um, I think when we listen to the people that were leading and that the people that were coaching, then that always works well leading those around you by being a learner and mm -hmm. being accepting of feedback and um, having a true genuine desire to get better based on that, I think is important. Mm -hmm. Heidi, Marcy, do you have any final words? We've almost ran out of time. We, I think all four of us could talk and talk about this topic uh, throughout the evening. So thank you for joining. Heidi, do you have anything else? Marcy? Yeah, I would completely agree, Claire. I think I could talk about coaching um, just because I've watched, I've, you know, I was coached just for a few years, but I've just watched the amazing things that the power of um, coaching can happen. And, you know, I think that we kind of get in the culture of talk sometimes. Um, we get stuck in there as educators and we have all these great ideas and have um, intentional goals for ourselves. But if we really truly want to commit to continuously refining our practices and giving our students our absolute best, coaches can help partner with your teachers and support that. Um, and I really do feel like uh, instructional coaches, facilitators, specialists, integrationists, whatever their their role is, have such a vital um, role of helping support teachers for student achievement. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marcy. Heidi? Um, yeah, just a final thought is, um, you know, based on what I think everyone was saying tonight was um, you always put relationships first mm -hmm. um, and um, be responsive to your community's needs as you develop your coaching or integrationist style. Um, and I really believe like it's okay to try out different models um, and then settle into the one that makes the most impact for you, your students, the stakeholders. Um, you really just have to have to respond to um, to your environment. Thank you. We want to thank everyone for tuning in to our latest episode of Educators Without Borders, where we convene leading voices in education to discuss issues that matter. To my colleagues, Heidi, Marcy, and Sarah, thank you for being a part of this and sharing your knowledge and experience. Remember to hit that subscribe button, like and follow to stay up to date on the latest news, panels, webinars, and more from School Rubric. 
I want to wish everyone a wonderful spring semester, and we'll see you all very soon. Bye. Thank you for watching Educators Without Borders. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we highlight voices and perspectives of educational leaders across the globe. To stay in the know with our latest upcoming panels, interviews, tutorials, and more, make sure that you follow us on social media or visit us at schoolrubric.com. Thank you.